Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, for praise from the upright is beautiful. Praise the Lord with the harp. Mark melody to him with an instrument of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy, for the word of the Lord is right, and all his work is done in truth. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Just Love in Person Sunday message. My name is Sharika King Gentry. We want to congratulate and celebrate all teachers, parents, and students across North Carolina, and especially in Person County for making week one a success. Without a doubt, we can all succeed even in times like these if we work together and each give our best. Please join me now for a word of prayer followed by our message by Michael Gentry. Oh Lord, we come to you thanking you for allowing us to have the opportunity to be in your presence again. Thank you for waking us up, getting us started on this day, Lord God. Lord, we thank you for the protection you've provided for students and teachers as we finished up one week um, of school here in Person County, Lord God. We thank you, Lord. We pray a hedge of protection over students and teachers, um, Lord God, as they do the work that they need to do, Lord God, to teach and train our, ch our children, Lord God. Lord, I pray as kids now operated a new normal with back in school, Lord God, that they adapt well, that you keep them, Lord, that they still continue to learn and grow in this time. Lord, we pray over NC State and UNC and other schools that have opened up and continuing to see COVID-19 cases rise in their schools and institutions. Lord, we pray for a speedy recovery of those students. Um, Lord God, that nothing is passed to their family members as they go back home, Lord. I pray that professors, Lord God, learn a new way to teach our children that are now in college and now having to experience either whether it's their freshman year, Lord God, or upperclassmen with online classes, Lord God. I pray that you continue to keep us as we see COVID-19 cases rise. I pray for a vaccine to be developed, Lord God. And I pray is that we go into second week of school that you keep us. I pray for administrators that have done a phenomenal job of building a plan for teachers and students to go into the building and learn. And Jesus, I just thank you for the message that we are about to receive. I pray that it's nourishment to our souls, Lord God, and gets us going for the week that is before us. In Jesus' precious name, I do pray. Amen. Hello, everyone, and thank you for clicking on the Just Love in Person Sunday message. Today's message is entitled, The Battle is the Lord's, and it comes from 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 1 through 24. We've all heard the phrase, the battle is the Lord's, but we often don't hear about this story wherein such a statement is made and exemplified. The star of this story, King Jehoshaphat, is one of the lesser known Hebrew kings. We all know about Saul, David, and Solomon. Most of us have heard of Hezekiah, and if you study anything pertaining to the Babylonian captivity, then you may know the names Jehoiakim and Jehoiakim, the two kings that preceded that tragic 70 years of exile. But Jehoshaphat doesn't really come to mind for a lot of people, which is unfortunate because Jehoshaphat was one of the few whom God called good kings along with the aforementioned David and Solomon and Hezekiah, and also Jehoshaphat's father, Asa. Jehoshaphat ascends to the throne three generations after the split of Israel, 
when the northern ten tribes broke away from the southern tribes of Judah and Benjamin and made their own kingdom. The northern kingdom collectively still maintained the name Israel and was sometimes called Ephraim because of its most prominent tribe. But the southern kingdom just went by Judah. Now the Judahite kings were the legitimate kings of all Israel because they descended from David and were part of the ancestral connection between David and the future Messiah. The northern so-called kings were illegitimate and wicked. They refused to go down to Judah where the temple was and worship Yahweh their God as he had commanded and they hindered their people from doing so as well. Instead, they created their own religious practices and worshiped the idols of the nations around them. Because of all this, all the northern kings were deemed by God in the books of the kings to be bad kings. As for the Judahite kings, they had no reason to fall into idolatry. All the elements for proper worship of Yahweh were in Judah. But still, many of them also fell into idolatry, which ultimately led to the Babylonian captivity. We told the story last week of the Judahite kings Ahaz and his grandson Manasseh, who did so evil that their actions came to symbolize hell itself. Very few of even the Judahite kings were called good kings, but Jehoshaphat was one of them. Second Chronicles 17, three through six says of him, the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he followed the ways of his father David before him. He did not consult the Baals, that is the idol gods who were prominent in that region, but sought the God of his father and followed his commands rather than the practices of Israel. Talking about the pagan practices that they had fallen into. The Lord established the kingdom under his control and all Judah brought gifts to Jehoshaphat so that he had great wealth and honor. His heart was devoted to the ways of the Lord. Furthermore, he removed the high places and the Asherah poles from Judah. The high places being the area where idols would be worshiped and sacrificed to, and the Asherah poles basically being large carved images of the idols they worshiped. So Jehoshaphat tore down all the idols in Judah and he obliterated idol worship there. He also sent out prophets and Levites, Levites being the priestly tribe which took care of the temple. He sent out prophets and Levites to all of Judah in order to re-educate the people on the laws of God. And because of that, God made Jehoshaphat to have a great reign in Judah. The people loved him and his wealth and prestige grew abundantly. So much so that other nations began to honor Jehoshaphat. Second Chronicles 17, 10 through 11 says, the fear of the Lord fell on all the kingdoms of the lands surrounding Judah, so that they did not go to war against Jehoshaphat. Some Philistines brought Jehoshaphat gifts and silver as tribute. Now, these are Philistines, Israel's most hated enemy historically, but they're bringing gifts to Jehoshaphat as tribute, which means they basically are paying him in order to stay on his good side. And it continues saying, and the Arabs brought him flocks, 7,700 rams, and 7,700 goats. 
So Jehoshaphat, like David, was loyal to the one true God in a time when idolatry was rampant. And Jehoshaphat sought to change the heart of Israel back to the Lord, its God. So God blessed him and made him a rich and powerful ruler, even causing natural enemies to seek peace with Jehoshaphat. Now that also includes the northern kingdom of Israel. Jehoshaphat was so respected that the northern king Ahab, husband of Jezebel, sought a truce with Jehoshaphat by having his daughter marry Jehoshaphat's son. So Jehoshaphat and Ahab became in-laws and military allies, giving some sense of unity to Israel after having been split for many decades. But remember, Ahab was an evil king not simply because he was an illegitimate northern king, but because he and his foreign wife Jezebel murdered the majority of God's prophets in the north. Ahab was the king that Elijah, the prophet, had to go up against. So this wasn't a person Jehoshaphat should have been aligned with, even though they were fellow Israelites. And it was probably Jehoshaphat's desire to reunite Israel that sparked an obviously poor choice of an ally. In 2 Chronicles 18, we see that one day Ahab went to war and convinced Jehoshaphat to join him. Now, a prophet from God had foretold that Ahab would be killed if he went to battle. And Jehoshaphat feared going against God's warning but he did so anyway to maintain Judah's alliance with Israel. Now Ahab went into battle in disguise as an ordinary soldier, but he advised Jehoshaphat to remain in his kingly garb, knowing that the enemy was on the hunt for King Ahab. The captains of the enemy's army spotted Jehoshaphat in his kingly robes and they surrounded him to kill him thinking he was Ahab. But Jehoshaphat let out a shout and God saved him by causing the men to see that he was not Ahab. Yet Ahab, even in disguise as a regular soldier, was still shot with an arrow and killed. In 2 Chronicles chapter 19, we see that when Jehoshaphat got back to his palace in Jerusalem, Jehu the prophet came to him and said, Should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? Speaking about Jehoshaphat's attempt to align with Ahab. Because of this, the wrath of the Lord is on you, he said. There is, however, some good in you. For you have rid the land of the Asherah poles and have set your heart on seeking God. In other words, you got mixed up with the wrong people trying to do what you thought was good. But where you ought to suffer for fooling with Ahab, God is being merciful and generous to you because he's seen your commitment to him. And some of us can relate to that and trying to do what we felt other people would see as a good thing. We took some ill-advised steps and locked arms with some ne'er-do-well folk. And it would have been catastrophic for us if God hadn't stepped in and removed us from that situation. Jehoshaphat was a man after God's heart. So much so that God sheltered Jehoshaphat even from his own poor decisions, just like his ancestor, David. 
Chapter 19 concludes by telling us that Jehoshaphat continued to excel as a leader of the people. He overcame his poor decision and he committed himself even more so to God's work. It says he appointed Levites, priests and elders to be judges to settle criminal matters and civil disputes among the people of Judah. And he charged them in verse seven of chapter 19 saying, judge carefully for with the Lord our God, there is no injustice or partiality or bribery. King Jehoshaphat appointed judges to maintain justice in Judah because injustice is not of God. But then as we get to our text in 2 Chronicles 20, we see that trouble starts to come Jehoshaphat's way. The chapter opens with these words. After this, the Moabites and Ammonites with some of the Meonites came to war against Jehoshaphat. Now we've established that Jehoshaphat was such a great and mighty king by the hand of the Lord that even natural enemies of Judah sought peace with him. But here, at the height of his powers, we see that Moab and Ammon are coming up to wage war against Jehoshaphat and against Judah. Who are these foolish people? Well, we get some hint in verse 10 when Jehoshaphat is praying to God about the pending invasion. He said, but now here are men from Ammon, Moab and Mount Seir, whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. See how they are repaying us by coming to drive us out of the possession you gave us as an inheritance. You see, when the Israelites came out of Egypt, they came out as a mighty army prepared to execute judgment on all those wicked nations that God sought to remove from the promised land. That whole area of the world feared these former slaves out of Egypt. But God instructed the Israelites in Deuteronomy 2 not to attack Ammon or Moab or even provoke them to war because he would not be giving the Israelites the land of Seir which the Moabites and Ammonites lived in. So God spared the Ammonites and the Moabites. And really he spared the Moabites twice because the Moabites in their fear of the Israelites solicited the sorcerer Balaam in an unsuccessful effort to curse the Israelite people in Numbers chapter 22. So here in 2 Chronicles 20, these Moabites and Ammonites and other peoples of Mount Seir are coming against the people who had historically been merciful toward them. And again, this is at the height of Jehoshaphat's powers when even the Philistines don't want to smoke. But here are the Ammonites and Moabites coming to take shots at the throne. And there's a lesson here for all of us. It doesn't matter how large your profile is, how successful you are, how hard you work, how talented you are, how connected you are, how nice and friendly you are. There is always someone who is looking to oppose you. There is always someone looking to chop you down to size. Always someone who thinks they can elevate themselves by bringing you down. The people of Seir were the last people that should have been coming up against 
Judah. But there is always someone willing to be used by Satan to oppose God's work in us. Even when the biggest devils don't want none, there is somebody who does. But our response needs to mimic that of Jehoshaphat's. Notice Jehoshaphat didn't jump up and try to fight against Moab. In the face of trouble, he didn't take it upon himself to handle the trouble. We can't think that we are so strong that we can take on whatever comes our way. Notice also Jehoshaphat didn't try to tap into his connections. He didn't call on any of his allies to come help him fight. He saw what happened the last time he linked up with a so-called ally. In times of trouble, we can't take things into our own hands and we can't trust others to come get us out of the trouble. We have to turn to God. Starting with verse 3, it says, Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord. And he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. They fasted in order to get a response from God. Verse four, the people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in front of the new courtyard and said, Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. Our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? They have lived in it and have built in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, if calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or the plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and will cry out to you in our distress and you will hear us and save us. There we see that Jehoshaphat and all Israel fasted and prayed in order to move the heart of the Lord to defend them from what was coming their way. And as they did so, the word of the Lord came to Jehaziel the Levite. Jehaziel stood up and said to them, Listen, King Jehoshaphat, and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. The battle is not yours, but God's. Remember, David uttered a similar statement when he, as a young teenager, went up against the giant Goliath. Before slinging a stone into Goliath's forehead, David yelled at him, All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. Well, now here is David's descendant, Jehoshaphat, and David's kindred, the tribe of Judah, and Jehaziel the Levite has stood up in their midst and proclaimed by the Holy Spirit, do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Then he said in verse 17, you will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed, 
Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. Jehoshaphat then fell to the ground and worshiped the Lord and all the people with him. Then the Levites stood up and started praising God with a loud voice. As we mentioned earlier, the Levites were a tribe of Israel who were in charge of the worship practices. The priests who made the sacrifices for sin and other offerings, whom verse 19 calls the Korahites, they came from the tribe of Levi. And the rest of the Levites taught the law, managed the temple, and thus managed the worship in Israel. So the tribe in charge of worship led the worship. They stood up and praised God with a loud voice. The next day, when it was time to go out to battle, Jehoshaphat said in verse 20, listen to me, Judah and people of Jerusalem, have faith in the Lord your God and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets and you will be successful. Then starting with verse 21, it says that he appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out at the head of the army, saying, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. As they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. The Ammonites and Moabites rose up against the men from Mount Seir to destroy and annihilate them. After they finished slaughtering the men from Seir, they helped to destroy one another. When the men of Judah came to the place that overlooks the desert, and looked toward the vast army, they saw only dead bodies lying on the ground. No one had escaped. So God caused Judah's enemies to fight against themselves. The Ammonites and Moabites turned on the men from Mount Seir who came to battle with them. And then the Ammonites and Moabites turn on each other. And by the time Judah got to the place of battle, their enemies had slaughtered one another and were all laid out in the valley. Thus, the battle was over before it ever began. But notice, all that slaughtering that Ammon and Moab did to one another occurred while Judah was worshiping. Verse 22 said, as they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Sir. But there's even more to that point. In verse 21, it said, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness. And those men went out at the head of the army. The worshipers went out in front of the fighters. They were headed to battle, but those singing praises, not those with swords, were out in front because the battle was not to be won by the hand of the fighters, but by the hand of God. That's not to say that there is never a time for soldiers to fight. Jehaziel said in verse 17, you will not have to fight this battle. Most times when the Lord sent the army out to fight, they still had to swing the swords but he fought through them and manipulated the battle to go their way. It was special occasions like this where he fought for them and they didn't have to fight at all. But soldiers need to always be ready to do what soldiers do. As the old hymn says, am I a soldier of the cross, a follower of the lamb? 
And shall I fear to own his cause or blush to speak his name? Must I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease while others fought to win the prize and sail through bloody seas? Sure, I must fight if I would reign. Increase my courage, Lord. I'll bear the toil, endure the pain supported by thy word. When that illustrious day shall rise and all thy armies shine in robes of victory through the skies, the glory shall be thine. Soldiers of the cross must always be ready to fight the good fight of faith. Too often people assume or perhaps hope that because the battle is the Lord's, they won't have to fight. Ah, God's got it. I ain't going to say nothing. I'm going to let God handle it. If you're the one that he's allowed to see that something is wrong, then he might be trying to handle it through you. Soldiers must be ready to do what soldiers do. Nevertheless, the battle is the Lord's. And when the battle is the Lord's, the soldiering is secondary. The worship is primary. There's a battle going on today in our society. Not a physical battle as what Jehoshaphat was facing, but a battle for justice. Within the battle for justice is the quest for fairness, equal education, equal opportunity, equal and fair pay. Within the battle for justice is the quest for wrongdoers to be held accountable so that we don't continue to have a culture in which people feel they can get away with harmful or immoral actions. Within the battle for justice, there's the quest to have all voices heard, to end voter suppression and other acts of disenfranchisement. Within the battle for justice, there's a quest to end the exploitation of the poor and needy, to end price gouging and stop politicizing and attacking programs that help the less fortunate. In the battle for justice, there is an active enemy who desires only to steal, kill, and destroy. So soldiers must be ready to do what soldiers do. And all who claim Christ are soldiers of the cross. The fight for justice then is not just a black fight or a women's fight or a poor people's fight or a minority fight. All Christians should be in the fight for justice because as Jehoshaphat told his judges, Within the Lord our God, there is no injustice or partiality. All Christians must fight for universal justice because a just society is a righteous society. But that fight is at its core a spiritual fight, which means it's God's fight. Therefore, worship over and above the battle cries, the marching and the fighting, worship is what leads to victory in the battle for justice. Because as we saw with Jehoshaphat, worship puts the battle in God's hands. That's why Julia Ward Howe in that faithful year of 1861 penned the words that would become the battle hymn of the Republic. Mine eyes have seen the glory of of the coming of the Lord, he is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. If we want justice now, finally, in the land of the free and the home of the brave, we have to make God first and foremost. Because the battle for justice is the Lord's. He can't fight from behind us and he can't fight if we push him off the battlefield. If the fight is to be won, 
he has to be allowed to be in front. Worship puts him in front. Yes, if we are to be soldiers of the cross as God desires for us, then we are always facing down the barrel because we have an active enemy in Satan. But remember the words of 2 Corinthians 10 and 4, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. The battle is the Lord's. And as long as we worship him and put him first, then regardless of whatever else is required of us, the victory will be ours in the end. Amen. Thanks for worshiping with us. We hope that you were blessed and you are pumped and ready for worship service with your church. As you go about your day, please remember that there's lots of ways you can uplift your community. Just pray about what God would have you to do and go for it. We all need each other right now, so let's help each other out. I'm Imani Winstead, signing off for Just Loving Parsons.